I was a first year undergraduate student, dragging myself to one of my first ever exercise science laboratory classes. I felt pretty tired, but excited nonetheless. Just the night before, I had been up longer than I should have been, reading about a fascinating secret way to build muscle, the phenomenon of muscle hyperplasia. I eventually got to the lab, sat down, and made it through the lesson. Truth be told, I don't remember what the lab was about, but I do remember why I showed up in the first place. Once the lecture was over, I called our lecturer 101. I asked him, does muscle hyperplasia occur in humans? He looked a bit taken aback, like I'd asked him a question I shouldn't have, before shaking his head and saying, no, it doesn't. And the conversation pretty much ended there. I felt as though I'd been dismissed a bit too quickly. And sure enough, only a few weeks later, he emailed me out of the blue. He explained that he'd been dismissive, that there was some evidence for muscle hyperplasia occurring in humans, but that it wasn't enough to be conclusive. See, there are two ways of building muscle. Most of the time when people speak about muscle growth, they're referring to muscle hypertrophy, individual existing muscle fibers growing in size. This increase in size can occur at the macroscopic level and the microscopic level. At the macroscopic level, the individual fascicles of muscles, bundles of individual muscle fibers, can also increase in size. So that's muscle hypertrophy, an increase in some element of existing muscle components. But what about muscle hyperplasia? Could you define what muscle hyperplasia is for us? Sure. So when we think about hyperplasia, we're thinking about the number of muscle fibers. So we're not talking about the growing of the existing number of muscle fibers that you have. Um, we're talking about adding entirely new muscle fibers to your muscle. So that's what we think about typically in the context of, of hyperplasia. And, you know, hyperplasia is a process that happens early during development um, in your muscles. You know, like there's primary and secondary myogenesis. There's a point at which you add a bunch of new muscle fibers. But then those muscle fibers, once they're there, uh, there comes a certain point where you're just making them grow and you're not adding new ones in order to make the whole muscle grow, right? And so, yeah, hyperplasia would be like, you and as an adult for instance you engaged in some something whatever some activity that caused you to go from having 100 muscle fibers in your biceps for instance to going having 150 and those numbers are just i'm pulling them out of my you know whatever that's <laughs> those aren't accurate numbers but just to, for the for the sake of argument that's that's what hyperplasia would be. whereas hyper hypertrophy is saying you have 100 fibers and those 100 fibers just got bigger that's professor kevin murak expert in the area of muscle physiology and muscle hyperplasia we first found out about muscle hyperplasia in animals. Seminal studies in the area weighted down animals' muscles with insane weights. For example, a study by Antonio and colleagues progressively weighted down the anterior latissimus and the storsi muscle of 26 Japanese quails with up to 35% of their body weight over a period of 38 days. They observed the largest increase in muscle mass in the literature to date an insane 334 increase in muscle size and a 90% increase in the number of muscle fibers in the lat. A few dozen other studies using stretching protocols have found similar results, both an increase in muscle mass and a demonstrable increase in fiber number, aka hyperplasia, though the results were lesser in magnitude in those other studies. Importantly, it probably doesn't have to be stretching either. A series of studies in weightlifting, cats by Gonia and colleagues, Found that muscle hyperplasia also occurred when doing more traditional protocols. In his studies, cats were trained to perform a wrist flexion exercise against resistance to receive a food reward. Yet again, his studies found increases in fiber number from around 10 to 20 percent from this resistance training protocol. The evidence in animals is quite clear. Muscle hyperplasia does occur, both from stretching and lifting protocols. But what about humans? Well, the evidence is much scarcer for a few reasons. For one, human muscles often contain a few hundred thousand individual fibers, making it difficult to directly count fiber number. Instead, to assess muscle hyperplasia, you would require access to advanced equipment. You need to take out a chunk of muscle, what we call a muscle biopsy, and painstakingly count these fibers. But it gets worse. If you wanted to see whether performing resistance training induced muscle hyperplasia, you would need to take out a chunk count muscle fibers, then have participants train, then do the whole thing again. And unfortunately, you couldn't just get away with taking out a small chunk of muscle and assume that you're obtaining a representative sample. That's because fiber cross-sectional area only correlates moderately with whole muscle cross-sectional area. 
So to get an accurate estimate of fiber number, you would need to excise so much of the muscle that it would be impossible for a study like this to clear ethics, much less recruit willing human subjects. Since studies only ever look at a limited number of muscle fibers, this limits the strength of the evidence. Instead, most studies are indirect and cross-sectional in nature. Researchers compare the muscle mass of untrained and trained populations. For example, several studies have compared the cross-sectional area of bodybuilders and untrained folks. Cross-sectional area simply refers to how big a cross-section of the muscle being measured is. Then, these studies measure the cross-sectional area of a few individual muscle fibers. If the bodybuilder's muscle cross-sectional areas are 50% larger than the one of the untrained folks, all else being equal, you would expect their individual muscle fibers, which make up the whole muscle, to also be 50% larger. However, that's not what most studies find. There is a disparity between the two, likely because the bodybuilders have a greater number of muscle fibers. Now, there are two competing schools of thought here. The first, more skeptical explanation, is that bodybuilders self-select to continue lifting. Bodybuilders are born with a greater number of muscle fibers, which helps them grow faster. They're predisposed to being successful bodybuilders. If you have more fibers, and they all grow at 10%, you'll grow faster than someone with fewer fibers, after all. Effectively, the proponents of this stance argue that these findings are a case of survivorship bias. I'm somewhat skeptical of this argument, if only because there are many other factors that can influence whether you grow well or poorly, making it unlikely that bodybuilders consistently have more fibers than non-bodybuilders. However, as I described, there are quite a few limitations to existing studies in humans, even the ones that estimate bodybuilders have more fibers than non-lifters. Likewise, there are some other convincing arguments against muscle hyperplasia taking place in humans. So you mentioned that hyperplasia can take place and does take place in humans during development. Mm. Do you think it can and does take place in adult humans, for example, engaging in resistance training? I'm gonna have to say probably not to be perfectly honest. Um, and my opinions have kind of, you know, waned and waxed on this. And, you know, I've thought about it a lot and I've read a lot of literature. I've written literature myself on the topic. And I'm sort of of the opinion that if it is happening in humans, it's usually in an extreme scenario. Um, I would think in a like response or like really intense resistance training, maybe intense resistance training that's supplemented by anabolic steroids. Um, and it's not a mechanism of growth that I think is probably common to most, uh, most conditions in humans. The alternative stance is that lifting does result in the addition of new muscle fibers. And most such studies on exercise, not just lifting, do support this contention. Some studies find a difference in size between a trained population and an untrained population can be purely explained by larger individual muscle fibers, but most studies' results can only be explained by a greater number of muscle fibers. For example, a 2024 study by Mayo and colleagues found that subjects with long-term resistance training experience did have both 70% larger biceps, but also had 34% more muscle fibers than untrained subjects. They also packed in more myofibrils per muscle fiber than untrained individuals. You can think of myofibrils in a muscle fiber as sardines in a can. There are a couple of important caveats to the findings by Mellian colleagues. First, they inferred the whole muscle's cross-sectional area from individual fiber cross-sectional areas, which only correlate moderately. What are your thoughts on those studies that find that trained populations have a greater fiber number, indicating hyperplasia, than untrained populations? Yeah, you, you alluded to it a little bit there because the technical aspect is not something that we can we can just brush under the rug. Like, so how do you really mm -hmm. measure that in, in live people, right? A lot of times you're doing calculations based on the size of muscle fibers from a biopsy versus the size of the whole muscle versus considering the pination angle and the interior architecture of the muscle and then calculating all these things. And that's a lot of factors um, where if you're off by a little bit, it could end up leading to sure. a big estimation that is not accurate. Second, these types of studies cannot strongly infer causality. For that, you would need a randomized controlled trial. Fortunately, there is some additional evidence for muscle hyperplasia occurring in humans. Where? in human cadavers. Some researchers found that there exist side-to-side -side imbalances in muscle fiber number, in the tibialis anterior muscle, for example. Since many tasks in daily living present asymmetrical demands, this suggests that physical activity, or exertion, can stimulate muscle hyperplasia, 
However, this study design isn't without its issues when it comes to making inferences about muscle hyperplasia either. Do you think that forms solid evidence in favor of exercise potentially causing hyperplasia, even things like walking or day-to-day -day tasks? I mean, I think that also could play into the argument that, you know, the, the side that you favored more just had a tendency to hang on to the fibers as opposed to you building more throughout the lifespan. That's, and that's the argument I would probably advocate for is that, yeah, that the favored side, so if that is happening, the favored side was the one that was being activated more, so you just didn't lose as many. Overall, it appears possible that muscle hyperplasia could occur in humans from lifting. However, how does it actually occur? There are two primary proposed ways. The first one is well documented. When a muscle fiber experiences a large degree of muscle damage, this can stimulate fiber splitting. One muscle fiber turns into two. The second is less well documented. Muscle cells have what are called satellite cells. As the name implies, these are cells that float around your muscle cell and play various roles. Upon exercising, these satellite cells can fuse, yes, just like in Dragon Ball, into a new muscle fiber. What's generally clear about these two methods is that they tend to occur in the presence of a large amount of muscle damage. Don't get me wrong, muscle hypertrophy can absolutely occur in the absence of muscle hyperplasia. But when you observe a large increase in muscle size, there is a chance that you also stimulated muscle hyperplasia and an increase in muscle fiber number. This begs an important question. Since muscle hyperplasia is a whole different way to grow muscle, can we intentionally stimulate muscle hyperplasia? Unfortunately, the answer is that we don't fully know. Kevin is skeptical. Is there any form of resistance training you would actually advocate for or think would be more likely to cause hyperplasia versus like other forms? Like, would you chase muscle damage as a means to induce hyperplasia in humans? No, nope. no, nope. shake my head hard. No, I would not do that. <laughs> I would not advise that. Uh, no, I, I don't think that's something you should be striving for in your training. I don't think that, you know, doing some sort of damaging exercise continuously to gain more fibers is a safe or smart strategy. But recall what I said earlier. What's generally clear about these two methods is that they tend to occur in the presence of a large amount of muscle damage. With that being the case, forms of training that induce more muscle damage may help in this pursuit. Probably the biggest stimulus for muscle damage is novelty. Performing exercises you've never done or that you haven't done in a long time. Similarly, eccentric training generally causes more muscle damage than concentric training. Training closer to failure may also cause greater muscle damage. So, if you're inclined to believe muscle hyperplasia can occur from lifting, incorporating some heavy eccentric only exercises or forced reps, like Nordic curls or reverse Nordic curls, or pushing to and past failure on occasion, could be good ways to stack the odds in your favor. Who knows? You might just build more muscle by stimulating muscle hyperplasia. At the very least, just like I did during my first year in undergrad, I hope you come away from this video being curious about muscle hyperplasia as a way to grow muscle. The topic remains divisive for reasons that should be clear by now. If you enjoyed the video, you'll enjoy our newsletter. We cover new research about building muscle and strength every two weeks. No spam ever. Likewise, if you'd like to get an experienced coach to help you reach your goals, go to strongbyscience.com slash coaching. Kevin, you killed it. Where can people find you and your ongoing research? Sure. Uh, well, uh, I'm on uh, X, I guess. I want to call it Twitter, but X. Uh, Kevin Murak, PhD. I have an Instagram too, but I don't really use it that much. But there's some pretty pictures there for you of muscle and things, like the ones I have in my background. Uh, my website, uh, University of Arkansas. You can Google me, M3R Lab, University of Arkansas. You'll find me there. Um, and you can always just email me too um, if you have questions. So. Yeah, that should be easy hey, to find. That's how we made this happen. So we'll put all your links in the description. Milo Wolf, Strong by Science. Until next time.